since you got rid of me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We are here. Uh, it's Wednesday, May 27th, 2020 at 9 in the morning. We're here for our weekly board session in the center of hearing room 555 Court Street Northeast uh, in Salem. As always, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We don't have anybody signed up for public comment, and so we're going to jump uh, right into our first presentation. So Katrina... She seems anxious. That worries me. ...going to give us a COVID-19 update. Just had a lot of coffee, that's all. Uh. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Katrina Rothenberger, Public Health Division Director for Marion County Health and Human Services. Uh, for yesterday, May 26, we had 914 cases, which includes presumptive cases, and 898 positive tests. Um, so the, the 914 cases will fluctuate as the presumptive folks are tested. Uh, we've had 9,762 total people tested in Marion County and uh, 25 deaths. Um, our seven-day case count is encouraging an encouraging trend with only 37 cases over the past seven days we haven't seen a day where we've climbed over 10 cases so um, that's really encouraging for us in public health but um, now is really the time where we uh, still continue to build capacity should we uh, need to respond to any sort of increases in the future or even this winter during flu season uh, so we're continue to build our capacity for contact tracing and we'll have another 19 folks on board by June 22nd. Um, we also are entering into contracts with other organizations for contact tracing support to surge up if we need it. Um, so the other exciting thing is that we've uh, assigned a coordinator to work specifically with our agricultural uh, farmers and farm workers here in Marion County to make sure that they have what they need to ensure continuity of operations with regard to testing, personal protective equipment, cleaning, and uh, education. So we're really excited to get that work going. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone as we enter into phase one with our limited reopening, it's still really important to engage in those healthy behaviors of washing our hands frequently, uh, wearing a mask when we're out in public, and continuing to social distance. Um, and especially if you're a part of one of those high-risk groups, it's still important that you uh, are making essential trips only. Um, it is really exciting that we are able to go and enjoy some of the things that we've been missing for the past several months and I just really hope that everyone continues to do that safely and and is mindful of those around them with engage with the six feet social distancing and wearing a mask in public thank you thank you Katrina any questions for Katrina or comments I might have a couple I don't know why I've never asked you before on the presumed cases what's the probability is it just about 100 percent that they they actually will test positive someday or not necessarily no. uh, we have seen folks who test both positive and negative who are included in that presumptive but i, I don't have a s exact number for you so it's not definite it just looks like it yeah okay and then so we've reopened are you are you thinking friday's a bad day or how, what's what's your what's your litmus test here um, I don't really, I haven't made the best predictions <laughs> so far. <laughs> um, I am really waiting to reserve any uh, assumptions until a week or two post opening. Um, it, the incubation period for COVID is anywhere between two and 14 days. So I expect in a week or two, we could, if any trends emerge, it will be then. But um, just out in public, I noticed that there's a lot of people out and about without wearing masks. And a couple weeks ago, there was a lot more folks wearing masks at the grocery store. I mean, this is just my obs observation. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I had to guess, I might we might see a few more cases in a couple of weeks. I hope not, but that's what I've been thinking too. Katrina, can you give us some context? 
the numbers have been pretty good this week. Mm-hmm. How does it compare to last week? Or is this are these the lowest numbers since the beginning? Are they trending down? It's hard to say because of the outbreak at the prison. Those do contribute to our numbers, okay, and I would that. need to go back and check uh, to see what that looks like between with our um, outbreak at the prison. So those do count for Marion County, um, and certainly the last a week ago was when a lot of those cases emerged from the prison. Got it. Taking off my mask to talk, I guess. Six feet away, I can do that. It's so, about five and a half, just so you know. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, and thank you too, Commissioner, <laughs> for always making sure I'm perfect. Uh, so I just want to thank you and Ryan and, and your team and now Michael uh, to help us with the um, Marion County Farm Bureau coordination. And things are moving really fast. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that, uh, again, I'll say this, last week went home on Wednesday kind of like wanting to celebrate, you know, we graduated, but we didn't really graduate. We only finished our freshman year. And uh, we, that's the analogy, by the way. I did graduate uh, from both high school and college. <laughs> I did not, finish my MBA, did not finish my MBA, only got a year of that done. But um, it, it's, it's really uh, exciting, but also um, a little anxious as we move forward to figure out uh, in Marion County, some of the really important moving parts. Number one, agricultural community, uh, you know, farm gate produ- production in the state of Oregon. And we've got a lot of people that are going to be moving in and through our community here in the next few months. And the work that we're working on right now, um, we actually made some contacts yesterday and have some follow up calls today for uh, what, how do we handle these people if, if somebody gets sick and, and to stop some, some outbreaks. And I'm just real thankful that you and your team um, are working so hard and I just don't think people realize we're open and they're they're going around in stores without face masks or whatever and and uh, the the type of work that's still going on to help us get through actual graduation where we can get through this and have systems in place to protect the health of 340,000 plus citizens in Marion County so I just want to again every every week you sit there I want to say thank you for the work you're doing and um, together and it really has been a team effort with all our departments to make sure we we can get to to where we need to go we know this is going to stay with us and when it when it happens we want to make sure we can protect those uh, those that are most vulnerable from and i think that's another thing that we can recognize is that we haven't had uh, outbreaks in any of our senior facilities lately that's correct we've got we've gotten that better control mm-hmm. that's not to say that we won't have some of those in the future but uh, those are our most uh, vulnerable um, people when it comes to hospitalization and potential um, de- uh, life-threatening uh, this is this this virus can be so thank you very much thank you mr chair thank i guess you i shouldn't take you. that off my Appreciate ear it. it's a big ear ring isn't it sam <laughs> next up we have uh, sherry linter and we're going to do an annual volunteer report and awards presentation Good morning, Sherry. No, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Okay, well, good morning, Chair Willis, Chair Brentano, and Commissioner Cameron. Then he returns. I am Sherry Lindner, Volunteer Services Coordinator for Marion County. I work in our Human Resources Department. And I am here this morning. Um, I'm pretty excited. I'm here to present two things. We'll start this morning with our 2019 Volunteer Annual Report 
which actually I think is going to set the stage very nicely for our second agenda item, which is our 2019 Volunteer Awards. So uh, there's a lot to cover, so I'm going to go through the slideshow. I'm going to do a lot of reading off my notes just so that I can get through all the material. Um, okay, so you each have a copy of the annual report um, here in your pile. And you also have a copy of what I am referring to as department details. And it's a two-pager that breaks down each county department and their programs and divisions. Um, I'll just note that uh, the county has 15 departments and 10 of those departments hosted volunteers in 2019. So I wanted to pull up this slide because one of the things that happened this year uh, was we changed the format of our annual report. So I just wanted to give you a visual of what that report looks like now because it is a little bit different than what you're used to looking at. We've uh, taken it down now to a four page format. With previous, as with previous formats, uh, the report still includes the total number of volunteers as well as the number of hours and then that value calculation for the entire county as well then um, those summary numbers for each department. And then the other thing that you will see is uh, it just kind of reviews quickly some of the activities and roles within each of the departments. And um, so that's page one, page two, and then you can see we move on to page three and four. Uh, we scaled down uh, the report quite a bit, as you can see, from about 24 pages. And I actually was not sure I would have the discipline to do that this year because we have amazing volunteers. We have amazing volunteer stories. And the way they are working alongside our Marion County staff, uh, I feel like we could, we could fill a notebook um, with all the individual stories. But I, do, I was successful and it is down to four pages. Okay. So I don't want to spend a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time this morning, but I'm going to review the numbers that I think are well worth highlighting. And the first number that I want to talk about is the number of unduplicated volunteers. So in 2019, there were 1,730 individuals who volunteered for Marion County. Of that number, 1,557 were program volunteers. Those volunteers give their time to dog services, victim assistance, emergency management, working with juvenile at our juvenile, juvenile department, etc. We had 149 individuals who served on boards or committees. The county has about 20 active boards. Those uh, boards act as advisory boards to this body. And then we had 24 intern and practicum students. In all, those 1,730 1, individuals filled 2,548 slots, volunteer slots in 2019. And I want to share that, what I'm calling volunteer slots, volunteer roles, volunteer jobs. The reason I want to just emphasize that additional number of 2,548 is because I think it demonstrates the exceptional commitment to Marion, of Marion County volunteers. We have many volunteers who might volunteer with the program and serve on an advisory board, or they may volunteer with multiple programs across the county departments. I just think it's really telling of the level of engagement of uh, our folks here in Marion County. All right, this number, uh, 105,661, that is the total number of hours that our volunteers performed in 2019. Now, I think it's a little funny to put a value on our volunteers' contributions, um, but we do put a dollar value. 
And uh, this year, our value was based on the independent sector's 2018 rate. We use a rate of $25.43 an hour. Normally, we would see that rate get updated each year. I'm assuming that it's due to COVID and extraordinary impacts on that organization. We've yet to see the 2019 rate uh, be published. So using the 2018 rate, we do value our total volunteer hours at, uh, as you can see, quite a substantial dollar amount, $2,686,959. And then I'll just make a little note on that uh, rate that we see. I took a look back at several years, and generally the rate increases about 3% each year. So I, I'm going to share a couple highlights, a couple outcomes, but before I do that, I just want to go through uh, several slides of photos, and these are photos of our volunteers as, long with, as well as uh, a little bit of a label, if you will, to give you an idea of the variety of ways community members engage and volunteer here at Marion County. Um, as I mentioned, we have 20 plus advisory boards. We have volunteers that serve victims of crime. We have volunteers that provide family support, um, nutritional education, and basic needs. The Sheriff's Office Cadet Program uh, familiarizes young adults ages 14 to 21 with opportunities in law enforcement. Uh, giving them a, a path to a profession uh, while building individual responsibility, teamwork, and leadership skills. The Sheriff's Office also has rescue, search and rescue specialized units such as Jeep Patrol and Mounted Posse. The Sheriff's Office, Behavioral Health, Public Health, and the District Attorney's Office are examples of departments that host intern and practicum students uh, year-round. And then, of course, we have emergency response volunteers. Those can include our citizens' emergency response team, the firefighter rehab teams, the medical reserve teams, and our auxiliary communication team members. Okay, we have fair volunteers. We have master food preservers. We have folks that go out in the community and do education and food safety classes. Uh, well, okay, so this is one of my favorite. I did include a few pictures of our fixperts. This was a, a public event that Environmental Services, our master recyclers, hosted that uh, community members could bring in broken items and volunteers then would fix those items, uh, saving them from the landfill. And then this next slide, I'm not even going to talk about it because I think those pictures speak for themselves. Uh, four of the different volunteer activities that take place out at our dog services. And then just very, very quickly, I want to just share a couple of um, kind of what I would say high-level outcomes in 2019. 1,420 dogs were cared for at our dog shelter, uh, cared for and then either adopted, reunited, or placed with a, a, a specialty care organization. Over 2,000 victims of crime received support and advocacy. Our cadets provided security and traffic control at over 50 events. There were 5,900 open class, 4-H or FFA exhibit opportunities. The majority of those opportunities are for our youth. Uh, 65 items were brought to the repair fair and fixed. I think there were about 80 items, 80 some items brought in and 65 of them went out repaired. And then 144 families received health and educational support through our uh, WIC services. Okay. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to all the volunteers that have given of their time and talents. 
I want to um, take a quick moment to acknowledge and thank our department and program staff who manage the volunteers. Uh, they are really the key to the county's ability to offer meaningful volunteer opportunities to community members. And I also want to acknowledge department heads, elected officials, and of course the board's office because uh, none of this would be possible without support from you as well as department heads and elected officials. Volunteerism plays a very important part here in Marion County. I think it helps to build our relationship with uh, our citizens and our community, and it also builds our own capacity to offer services and supports. And um, what I have really learned in the last six months since I've been on the job, but I would say in the last month and a half through uh, you know, our COVID response, is that we also play an integral part in the lives of our volunteers. So I think we often look at what we get out of our volunteers, um, which uh, uh, it's amazing that the support that staff feels through the volunteers, but I was really touched by what the meaning that we hold for our volunteers, the important part that uh, volunteerism is in their life and the value and um, satisfaction that they are receiving when they come and, and help us out here at the county. So um, I just want to say thank you. And um, it just really would not be possible without your support. And i see if you have any questions, if you'd like to um, have question. any questions about the annual report. Yes, I would. Okay. First of all, I do like the report, and thank okay. you for presenting it. And just as you're talking, I was giving some thought to uh, the wonderful people I've met on the different boards over, over these years. I started making a list. Uh, SWAMAC comes to mind, and certainly interested in environmental and helping us figure out what, what our system does and what it will do for the future, and really important uh, parks. And we've we put more money into it, but these people have put more time in. And going to the meetings, they've kind of taken on uh, really kind of standing up for personal parks close to them. And I think people can see a big upgrade, and that's directly from those efforts. Um, emergency services, um, they're always ready to go. I know we have some listed here. Um, but in this time, they're almost chomping at the bit trying to find ways to help out more and deal with mm -hmm. whatever comes up. And then one that you, and I see Tammy in the back, when I first got here, Children and Families, a, a group that really was uh, looking to make things better for individuals in, in the community um, needs more importance than perhaps I or we've given it. But things change, 4-H and extension. And then there's some that people don't even know about, but we mm -hmm. meet uh, special districts and we have board members. Uh, I don't know if it's twice a year or four times, but they show up. Uh, know what the issues are in their, in their communities or in their interests and, and really matter. So mm -hmm. we really rely on them. People bring their expertise, their time, and contribute a whole bunch and makes it better for all of us. So thanks for coordinating all that. Well, you're welcome. And really the thanks <clears throat> goes to the department staff. I mean, I, lo I love my job. I'm thrilled to be the volunteer services coordinator for Marion County, but I would not have a job if we did not have our department staff who are actually hosting the volunteers, managing the volunteers, supervising, tracking their time, resolving issues when they come up. All those, all those things take time and effort, so. Um, and yes, uh, I will note that I am absolutely sure, I would stake money on it, that if you look at our numbers that are reported in this report, they are underreported. I feel strongly that our, our, our board members, our, our individuals that are serving on our committees, advisory boards, and in other capacities, often do a lot of work that they do not track or uh, report on. Uh, but it is important work, and it, it's the work that makes then those meetings, I think, valuable. That's a lot of dogs. <laughs> it is and a lot, lot of, of dogs. 
you, it know? is. It is. Um, the numbers are are staggering, and um, I think that that's really. I'm, I so appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk about the volunteers that are working, though, because those numbers. You look at the numbers across any department, what they're doing, what they're, we'll talk a little bit, I've got a little bit of information about dog, the dog shelter and what they're mandated to do. Uh, the value of the volunteers walking along our, aside our staff um, is immeasurable. Well, I, I see Ann's back here today with us for probably another reason, but uh, the, the uh, leadership she's brought to help with those volunteers has made a huge difference and I know it'll only get better next year yeah. um, uh, especially during this this time of year where fireworks start going off and all kinds of things happen and mm -hmm. those little guys I, I have a <clears throat> no, I'm looking at you why I have a I have a Labrador that oh. I can fire a shotgun over the top yeah. of her and it doesn't bother her but when those fireworks go off or mm -hmm. thunder and lightning she's like everywhere you can't you can't tame her down and I know that that's a good service but yes I really appreciate it. we miss you in the board's office by the way but we, we really appreciate your leadership and what you're doing here with thank volunteers. you I miss you guys I really do but I really really enjoy Tell the truth I I feel incredibly grateful uh, to work for the county right now I feel grateful for your leadership I feel grateful for um, <clears throat> Michelle Shelton's leadership. Uh, Jan Fritz is not here today. I wish she was here um, to see her face. Uh, yeah, I miss you guys, but I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's important. Well, thank you. All right. It's well, I have I, a second. Before we get to the, that, okay. I just, oh, so I noticed legal counsel has three volunteers. I'm thinking mm -hmm. that might be my life's work. I could get their files in some kind of shape like <laughs> nobody would <laughs> believe. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? I think Jane really would like that, I Commissioner. Think, yeah, or just, yeah, she looks you, like, I think you putting around her office, I think she'd really well, enjoy that. Maybe you'd recommend me. <laughs> That's a serious question. I saw tw 27 interns up there. Wasn't it 27? Pardon me? 27 interns? Uh, interns and practicum students. Mm -hmm. So where would those be? Where, where would those individuals have served? <clears throat> so a lot of our intern students are with Health and Human Services. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, so we get, uh, actually it's across the board, behavioral health, as you might expect, and public health as well. We have a lot of students that come through um, on their master's program looking for clinical hours, um, those kinds of placements. The sheriff's office hosts interns as well. Um, <clears throat> the district attorney's office hosts interns uh, through their, in their victim's assistance program. So it's pretty spread out uh, across, I would say probably five departments that are actually hosting interns and practicum students. And, you know, a lot of those programs have very stringent requirements, and it is quite a task for our staff to manage those, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for all your work, Sherry. Oh, you're welcome. Sure, appreciate it. Would you like to? Yes. So we have a second portion oh, now. I'm, great. I'll move on if you're ready. <clears throat> So I think the annual report actually did set the stage very nicely for our next uh, section, which is our 2019 Volunteer Awards. And um, well, I think what we find ourselves is here again with another first. So uh, <clears throat> this is our first virtual and our first virtual volunteer awards presentation. Traditionally, traditionally, our volunteers actually come to board session. You present the award to volunteers, uh, and then um, there's a small celebration. They have an opportunity to chat with you over a reception. Uh, due, due to the pandemic, obviously, we did not do a live uh, presentation this year. Instead, I teamed up with uh, department heads and volunteer managers and we presented awards individually to each of our recipients. 
today what I'm planning to do is we will recognize our volunteer award recipients through pictures. Uh, we took photos when we met each of when we met with each of those um, recently, and uh, what you'll find is almost all of our pictures of volunteer award recipients this year could also be used in the masks of Marion County campaign. <laughs> And um, I, I learned very quickly that having eyes open is very important in the time of COVID. <laughs> so I wanna just review very quickly. Uh, we recognize 2019 volunteers in five categories. And those are Program Department Volunteer of the Year, Advisory Board Volunteer of the Year, Youth Volunteer of the Year, Commissioner Mary Piermine Volunteer Group of the Year and the Judge Rex Hartley Volunteer of the Year Award. So I'm gonna start this year with our program awards. We are recognizing three individuals this year for their outstanding contribution to a Marion County program, the customer or clientele served in that program, or the overall community served by the program. These volunteers uh, displayed exceptional dedication and commitment to the programs where they volunteer. And I'm gonna go ahead and present those in no particular order. But we're going to start uh, with our first award, which is uh, someone out at emergency management. And we'll start with Rob Mill. Rob Mill was selected as the 2019 Emergency Management Volunteer of the Year. Since joining as a Citizens Emergency Response Team member in 2018, Rob has been very active, volunteering over 260 hours in 2019 to ensure that the Woodburn community is engaged, prepared, and resilient. So in addition to serving on the Woodburn Citizens Emergency Response Team, Rob is also a Woodburn Firefighter Rehabilitation Team member, and he has joined the Medical Reserve Corp, another piece of our Citizens Corp Emergency Response Team. Rob also, in 2019, became a CERT instructor, which means he is able to go out and provide the basic CERT training to other community members. So we really thank Rob for his dedication and his commitment. And um, I wanna, I'll just say a quick thing about Rob. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, how he's using that CERT basic training is he's engaging with Woodburn High School. He's engaging with the staff and trying to figure out a way where they can bring some basic emergency response uh, and preparedness skills to their youth. And uh, in many cases, then they feel confident that that youth will take that forward into their home and um, increase just the general awareness and ability to respond for the Woodburn community. So with that, I just want to say congratulations and thank you to, uh, to Rob. Uh, he's pictured here. We went out to Woodburn on um, the 18th, and he's pictured here with the Woodburn Fire Chief Budge and uh, Yuli Reich, who is a, another volunteer out in the Woodburn area. So congratulations, Rob. And then uh, I am going to make a little shift, think puppies. Mm -hmm. Our next recipient of a department award is Cheryl Smith Vanaka. Cheryl joined the dog shelter as a volunteer in 2018, and she has taken on many, many roles out at the dog shelter, fostering, um, acting as a adoption ambassador, helping uh, decorate and clean up the lobby. Uh, many, many uh, different tasks that Cheryl has taken on out at the shelter. Cheryl's open, friendly, and caring personality is greatly appreciated at the shelter. Uh, what I've learned is that the shelter lobby can be at times a very stressful location. You can imagine, you have people who are coming in, they have lost dogs, emotions can be running, running high, 
You also have families coming in that are elated and excited because they're adopting and picking up a new pet. Uh, there can be dogs and animals coming through. Um, there can be work crews. There can be a lot of things going on in the lobby. And the shelter staff report uh, that Cheryl's uh, open, friendly, caring personality really makes the world a difference uh, out at the dog shelter. And they also emphasize that she has incredible communication skills and her ability to work with constituents that coming, are coming in has been greatly appreciated. And, um, and then we'll go our third program department recipient is going to go to Marisol Cervantes with the juvenile department. Marisol is being recognized for her tireless effort to help bring a huge records project at Juvenile to completion. So I don't have a lot of details on um, what Marisol did during her time because I think the number on the screen really speaks for itself. Marisol started in September of 2019, and by the end of the year, she had scanned and or, or digitally organized 417,000 pages of records at the juvenile department. So she cleaned out much needed space, but more importantly, she has greatly improved our juvenile <coughs> staff's ability to quickly, efficiently access records. We want to thank Marisol for her commitment and service to the Marion County Juvenile Department. You can see uh, she's pictured here actually in the, at the new Juvenile Department with our Juvenile Director, Troy, Troy Gregg. And that concludes our program volunteer awards. I want to thank Rob, Cheryl, and Marisol for their volunteer service. Um, and we'll move on to our next award, which is for the 2019 Advisory Board Volunteer of the Year. This award recognizes an individual for their service, leadership, and commitment to a Marion County Advisory Board Committee or Task Force. And this year we are recognizing Eric Richards. Eric is a member of the Marion County Children and Families Commission, and he served on the commission uh, since 2016. And what um, really stood out uh, about Eric is uh, he's kind. He's just what I've been I've, I've learned and I've experienced a little bit with him uh, is that he really has steadfast leadership. Um, he has helped to strengthen some critical partnerships, including a partnership with the Salem-Kaiser School District, uh, which is, by the way, the largest school district in Oregon. And uh, so Eric is pictured here with the department director, Tamara Getch, and Melinda Hotala, one of the staff support for the commission. But Eric has been described as open, direct, generous and kind, and Eric has shown the highest level of commitment to the commission and their work. Uh, he serves on the steering committee as well as the full commission. Eric's knowledge, insight, and willingness to use his professional position to connect with stakeholders in a meaningful way has laid the groundwork for the commission's future work. We greatly appreciate Eric's contributions to the Marion County Children and Families Commission. This award was a little bit bittersweet because um, Eric is retiring this summer and actually moving out of the state. So it was, uh, it was really great to have the chance to um, recognize him for his contributions over the last three and a half years. He will be greatly missed, but it sounds like uh, they've been connected and they've got a new um, representative from the school district that will be joining, um, but clearly very big shoes to fill. <clears throat> so thank you, Eric. Uh, we appreciate his service. 
So now I will move on um, and we are going to recognize our 2019 Youth Volunteer of the Year. The Youth Volunteer, Year, Volunteer Award was developed to recognize the volunteer accomplishments of a young person aged 24 years or under that volunteers for a county program or department. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Lupe. Uh, Guadalupe Lagunas Garcia has been volunteering with the Marion County Law Library since July of 2019. And um, her impact to the library, law library was immediate. Um, and the law, law library is a very small staff. They have two staff. And Lupe's contributions meant that our paid professional staff had the time to do that professional level work, helping um, clients that walk through the door, um, doing some things that they, only they could give their time and attention. Uh, Lupe, I was going to list some of the things that she has done for the library, but honestly the list was quite long, so I'll just name a couple things. She organized materials, bookshelves, and forms. She scanned and made copies. Um, she pulled expired materials. She even learned the computer program so that she would be able to help do some of their editing. And then she also um, did rebinding and repairs on volumes of books. Staff describe Lupe as eager to learn, dependable, and as having great follow through. Uh, in addition to her volunteer service at the county, she works part-time and she is a student at Chemeketa. And her uh, goal was actually to become a librarian. So I think this is such a great example of a win-win uh, volunteer placement here at Marion County. And we just really want to thank um, Lupe for her dedication. And Jane, Jane joined us, um, as you can see in the photo. We, we, we maybe coerced Lupe a little bit to come downtown and let us take her picture, but she was very sweet about it, and it was really touching uh, to meet her. So thank you, Lupe. And then our next award is the Mary Piermine Volunteer Group of the Year Award. So uh, in addition to an actual physical award that the group receives, uh, they also are memorialized on a perpetual plaque and I've got the plaque here today you've got a photo that you can see this plaque hangs in Courthouse Square and the Mary Piermine Award honors the late Mary Piermine who served as a Marion County Commissioner from 1991 to 1998 in addition to being the first female commissioner uh, here at Marion County, Commissioner Piermine was a champion of volunteers, and she believed strongly in the power of volunteer groups. So this award recognizes a volunteer group for their outstanding contributions to Marion County in 2019. And with pleasure, I'm going to share a couple of pictures of the Woodburn firefighter rehabilitation team. They are the recipient of the 2019 Mary Piermine Volunteer Group of the Year Award. So the team is being recognized today for their commitment to emergency preparedness and response in Marion County and for, be, and for providing support to our first responders when it is needed most. So I'm gonna just, I'd like to take a minute, I know um, to, we want to be time sensitive, but I do think it's important to name each and every one of these members. They're not all going to be uh, in the photos, but quickly, members of the Woodburn Firefighter Rehabilitation Team are Brenda Bailey, Chris Best, Jim Bishop, Shirley Bishop, Michael Brewer, Christian Cooper, Ron Hind, Kevin Kanegi, Brenda Leader, Megan Lowmaster, Lupe Mercado, Robert Mill, Jacqueline Moore Vallejo, Gary Nelson, Sue Ann Nelson, Diane Nelson Cooper, Christine Patton, Tim Queen, Quinn, 
Yuli Wright, Charlotte Ann Robertson, William Robertson, Charles Schrantz, Resi Stockman Hind, Mickey Wagner, and Crystal Williams. So rehab team members play a really critical role in maintaining safety and integrity at a firefighting operation. And this is recognizing that, uh, I, I don't want to quote any stats, but um, Chief Budge did speak a little bit Monday about the, ri the high risk to our firefighters and emergency responders. And I think it's very interesting, and I think a lot of people don't really understand um, the risk that is ran when they are responding in the middle of an emergency response. But the firefighter rehab team is a critical uh, service. So they provide firefighters and emergency personnel with immediate medical attention, including hydration, treatment of smoke inhalation, the prevention of life-threatening conditions such as heat stroke and heart attack. So they really contribute and have a huge role to play in, res in responding to the physical and psychological needs of our first responders. And we just really want to say thank you to each and every team member of the Woodburn Firefighter Rehabilitation Team and congratulations on being the recipient of the Mary Piermine Volunteer Group Award for 2019. All right. Okay, the final award that I'm going to um, present today is the Rex Hartley Volunteer of the Year for 2019. And it is with pleasure that I present to you Julie Wallen, a volunteer with Dog Services. The Judge Hartley Volunteer of the Year honors the late Rex Hartley, who served as a county judge and was a commissioner for Marion County from 1951 and 19, to 1966. Judge Hartley was dedicated to involving citizens in the development of the county. And, um, and uh, I, I, I think it's really fitting that uh, this, this award goes to Julie Wallen with Dog Services. And, um, I'm going to talk really quickly, a very, very quickly about the shelter's mission. So the shelter's mission is to serve and protect dogs and communities throughout Marion County. Staff are tasked with enforcing Marion County dog licensing and control ordinances. They have to promote uh, humane treatment of dogs. They provide shelter and care for stray dogs until they're reunited with their family. And they provide education uh, to residents on uh, quality dog care. That's a lot. Uh, the load on our staff at the shelter is great. And volunteers like Julie Wallen make a huge difference. She, I'm gonna look and see if I have a list because I wanna um, really quickly go down some of the outstanding things about Julie. So, for one, she has infinite time and patience, and she also possesses a very specific set of skills. And those skills have to do with um, training and behavioral of dogs. Julie uh, has been providing specialized foster care. She's taken on some of our most challenging cases. And what the shelter staff has made really clear is what happens to those dogs when they go into foster care can make or break the outcome of a particular case. So when you have a volunteer like uh, Julie that they know exactly what her skill set is, what her capabilities are, she understands their mission and they know that those dogs are in good hands when they are placed with Julie. In 2019, Julie provided full-time foster care to 16 dogs. So in some of those cases, those dogs may have remained with her for up to 80 days. In many of the cases, uh, she actually took on puppies. She might take on litters of puppies. She might take puppies and mothers. 
uh, Julie's commitment to the well-being of the dogs that she cares for has left a, left a lasting impression with the people she works with at Dog Services. And it is uh, really with great pleasure that uh, we, we present Julie Wallen for the 2019 Judge Rex Hartley Volunteer of the Year Award. So I, I feel like that kind of, I went through that pretty quickly considering the amount of time and effort that our volunteers contribute. But thank you, thank you for letting me go through each of those. And then I just want to quickly again say thank you to our department volunteer managers. Uh, if not for them, it would not be possible. I also want to quickly acknowledge uh, the o Volunteer Awards Selection Committee. They met virtually this year, so they were able to turn on a dime. Uh, those folks who helped uh, review and select our award winners were Kevin Cooey with United Way of the Mid Willamette Valley, Julie Alberness with the Oregon Department of Education, Lindsay Gilstrap, a human resources uh, staff at a local company called Opal Open Dental Software, and Dean LaFranchi with the Marion County Clerk's Office. And then again, I want to thank uh, department heads, elected officials, and the board's office. Uh, truly, if not for the high value that you place on our volunteerism, we, we wouldn't be here today. And then uh, very, very quickly, I want to say one thing. Uh, we have a volunteer that is, uh, we don't actually register him with the Marion County Volunteer Services, but he's not here today. But every week, this gentleman shows up here. Uh, you never see him because he's back behind the curtain. But I just really quickly want to um, make a shout out to, to Joe Fabry and other CT, CCTV volunteers who show up here every Wednesday uh, working behind the scenes to make sure that this board session is taped and broadcast weekly and available for all members of the public to view. We value open and transparent meetings and feel it's the cornerstone of local government and volunteers like Joe help make that possible. And in closing, I just want to offer my gratitude and thanks. And on behalf of all of us, thank you to Rob Mill, Cheryl Smith, Marisol Cervantes, Eric Richards, Lupe Luganis Garcia, Julie Wallen, and the Woodburn Firefighter Rehabilitation Team. We value and thank you for your volunteer service. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> and then um, I just want to close to, again, things are a little different this year thanks to COVID, but by Friday on the volunteer website on the Marion County website we'll have the annual report we'll have the department details and we'll have photos of our award winners posted uh, for folks to see and then we'll do some social media press release etc around the awards wonderful thank you sherry thank you appreciate all your hard work on this any thoughts or comments before we move on i think you already said them. very good yeah you, you really covered the whole thing well i Good. I'm glad I got thorough. the most of it. Um, I wish that we had a little more time um, to really spend time with each of the volunteers. I'm hoping that there might be something in the future, a meet and greet with the commissioners or some uh, opportunity for you to uh, just really personally thank each and every one of our volunteer winners. And in closing, I think we just want to show our appreciation to all of our volunteers. So that thank you. That would be great. Thank you. OK. Um, next up, we have our consent agenda. And I think it's your turn, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, I'll move the consent agenda. The first item is on the Board of Commissioners OLCC application recommended approval. Lupa, Lupulo LLC DBA Topwire Hop Project. Under business services, approve a recommendation to adjust upward pay grades for classifications 038, election board workers, 
121 EBW processing and number 500 human services training. Also under business services, approve a recommendation to change units and adjust upward the pay grades for classification number 470 telecommunications technician and number 471 telecommunications technician senior. Under community services, approve an order authorizing the dog services director and dog service manager to adjust dog service late fees resulting from the impacts of COVID-19 and extend the date through August 31st, 2020. Also under business service, also under community services, approve amendment number two to the intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon State Fair Council, adding 58,000 for the new contract total of 340,000 $253.15 for the fairgrounds facility rental and trade agreement extending the term through June 30th, 2028 and adding the 2020 fairgrounds paving project. Also under community services approve an order appointing Melissa Glover to the Children and Family uh, Children and Families Commission with the term ending January 31st, 2022. Under information technology approve the purchase order with SHI International Corporation in the amount of $114,808.48 for the GroupWise and ZenWorks license renewal through June 30th, 2021. Under Public Works, proven order appointing Keith Bongdog Wynn as chair and Kylie Westerman Lewis as vice chair to the Solid Waste Management Advisory Council with terms ending April 30th, 2021. Also under Public Works, approve it reinstatement of amendment number one to the contract for services with Gresham Brickner Bratton Inc. to add $8,118.54 for a total of $106,528.54 for solid waste system analysts and feasibility study consultants through June 30th, 2020. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, next up, under Public Works, we have consideration of approval of the standard professional services contract with Dowell LLC in the amount of $782,591.40 for architect and engineering services for the North Fork Road slide stabilization project through June 30th, 2022. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Ryan Crother, Marion County Capital Projects Manager, here to talk to you about our North Fork Slide Stabilization Project, as you said, the Engineering Services Contract with Dow LLC. So the project's located just, e or well, not just east, east of Salem on North Fork Road uh, between mileposts 4.9 and 5.5. This is that gravel section of road that, that I think all of you have seen and are aware of. So the actual project scope when we get to construction will include stabilizing three separate slides slides two, three, and four. Slide one was stabilized in 2011. Uh, it'll also include reconstructing the 22 foot wide paved roadway and any work that's required um, to provide a, a functional and safe roadway. So with this contract, is we've gone into it in a, a sort of unique way where we're including the task to get to our preliminary design alternative stage. Uh, this is to, to really define what that final design is going to look like. Um, once we get there, we'll need to amend the contract, include that final design. Um, what that does, depending on which alternative we choose, it can really affect how much effort there is to finish that design off. Um, and we want to do that, so one of the big items here is an alternatives analysis. They're going to present different alternatives that show the cost benefit you know, for each one and, and kind of define how the best approach to solving this uh, problem uh, can be, be done. So this contract includes surveying, geotechnical investigations, environmental permitting, drainage design, utility coordination, roadway design, uh, landslide mitigation design, traffic engineering, uh, and traffic control, cost estimating, and a significant uh, alternatives analysis as I discussed. So there is a lot of work that goes into this, uh, this first piece. It's actually probably the most uh, time intensive portion of, of designing this project. Uh, the selected consultant was Dowell LLC. They were selected based on their qualifications, the fact that they've done similar projects, they've worked with uh, Western Federal Lands on similar projects throughout the state of Oregon. Um, 
we have uh, this contract includes $782,591.40 in design services. Um, this is a federally or a, a federal grant project. The total project budget is seven million three hundred twenty-two thousand eight hundred and ten dollars. Eighty-nine point seven three percent of this will be paid with the federal grant. Uh, the county share is ten point two seven percent, or seven hundred fifty-two thousand and fifty-three dollars. Uh, our pro schedule is uh, to begin preliminary design, assuming you approve this contract. Uh, finalize design and, and get through right away in 2021 and we hope to begin construction in 2022 uh, and then complete it in 2023. Um, with that, I'd ask if you have any questions. Any questions for Ryan? No. I'm glad this is moving along. This is much needed for 20, 20 year project. Yeah. yeah. Feels but like. If you notice those, I think it shows, I should ask Ryan, but those uh, plastic mar uh, edge markers they're not all in a line which says it's still moving isn't that what that showed so it's it's definitely still moving unfortunately that's actually why it's gravel is, is if we try to pave it you can see where the asphalt shifts and it's harder to, to maintain so we'll oh, go ahead oh, go ahead I'll I was just gonna make a motion yeah. you I'll uh, second it <laughs> oh after you make thank it. you <laughs> I thought maybe I did it I would make a motion we approve a standard professional service contract with Dell LLC in the amount of $782,591.40 for the North Fork Slide Stabilization Project through June 30th, 2022. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Are there any further discussion? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So uh, this one reminds me of, of course, I drive Highway 22 every day. And there's that slide on yeah, Highway 22 sure. uh, right on the lake that, I mean, it seems like ODOT just keeps putting more asphalt on top of it. And every day I go up there, I go, it feels like it moved another inch down. So this is one of the similar to that uh, project where hopefully we can stabilize it. I'm always concerned one of these days I'm going to try to get home and not be able to get there. See, I'm not an engineer like Ryan, but I heard sometime that like there's 18 feet of asphalt then you'll wonder when that gets so heavy it doesn't just take the hill down. Right. Exactly. Is that right? Isn't it some terrible amount? I, I know there's a lot there, and you're right. The more asphalt you put, the more weight there is, and you know, it can, can kind of not be a good thing. Just try to drive to the inside every night. Guys. I'll just get a little <laughs> teeny vehicle so it doesn't work. There you down. go. So we have a motion and a second, and we've had some further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Next up, looks like we have Commander Stutterud, and we're going to consider approval of the incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the City of Aurora, the amount of $196,430 to provide law enforcement services from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Good morning, Commander. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Jeff Stutterud, Sheriff's Office Enforcement Commander, here to talk to you and uh, ask for approval for intergovernmental inter inter funds an amount of $196,430. Uh, what this does is provides law enforcement services to the city of Aurora from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2021. Um, as I was here last week uh, talking about Aurora and then Jefferson prior, prior to that, Aurora is another unique community. They have amazing uh, old historic buildings in their, in their downtown area. Uh, they're very proud of those. In fact, we have some pictures over in the sheriff's office of the old jail that the, is still standing behind the city hall. Their, uh, Deputy Bill Chenikoff is working up there currently, uh, doing a great job for us and for the community of Aurora. Uh, I was talking to him or texting with him when I was coming down here. Uh, let me rephrase that. I was talking to him, <laughs> not texting and driving. Um, but... Um, we were talking about colony days, Aurora colony days, that uh, this would be their 31st year in August if, if uh, they continue with that. Um, and I don't know for sure if that's going to happen or not. Unfortunately, it probably won't due to the pandemic. But uh, they have some great events up there, concerts through the summertime. Uh, our deputies are very involved in the community in those events as well as colony days. So it's a great partnership with the sheriff's office in the city of Aurora. If you have any questions? No. Ask. no, any questions? Mm -mm. Thank you for continuing your good work. Thank sure you. appreciate it. All right. 
Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve an incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the City of Aurora in the amount of $196,430 to provide law enforcement services from July 1 to June 30th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay. Joe, I wanted to get the file out. Oh, tell them it's in my office. Okay, uh, next up we have a public hearing to consider zone change comprehensive plan case number 20-001, Chemeketa Community College on property owned by ANS Real Estate Management, LLC. And Joe went up to get the file, uh, but we have a public hearing here. So I will open a public hearing. And Mark Shipman is here. So Mark, if you want to come and... Give us your thoughts. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Mark Shipman, land use attorney with Sawfield Griggs, 250 uh, Church Street, Southeast, Suite 200, Salem, Oregon, 97301. Uh, here this morning on behalf of the applicant, Chemeketa Community College. Um, it's just, are we okay? Reading it out of order? I'm, ha I'm happy to wait, Commissioner. There's no, there's no legal problem though. It's just sort of. Well, it's it's in our code that we have a certain process. It's more which is to change. I think though, usually, like the applicant might want to rebut or address what the staff presents. I don't know that's the case here. Oh, Joe's here anyway, so we'll, okay, we'll so, so I apologize, Mr. Shipman. We'll uh, let Joe present, and then you can go. But you're welcome to stay there. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, we just didn't want to have some technical issue there. <laughs> Joe, we, we, I started without you, and, and Commissioner Cameron pulled me back. So I just want you to know you got something in your corner over here. This is in your office. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> as soon as she said you went to get the file, I was like, oh, man. I should have checked first. Sorry about that. All right, Joe, go for it. All right. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, this is Joe Finnamore. This item is an application for a zone change on property that is currently zoned unincorporated community industrial with limited use overlay. I'm the... <clears throat> uh, the request is to remove that limited use, which requires a new goal exception to uh, state planning goal, 13 agricultural, goal three agricultural lands. The 2.63 acre property is located on Portland Road in Brooks and contains a modular office and warehouse. It is in the Brooks Hopmer unincorporated community. Property to the northeast is zoned community commercial, developed with commercial uses. Property to the south and southeast is zoned EFU and in farm use. Property to the west is zoned public and is developed with the Schumacher Community College Brooks campus. The applicant plans to develop a diesel mechanic degree program on the subject property as part of their Brooks campus. Although the planning director determined the use could be allowed in the IUC zone, it is not a use permitted by the existing limited use overlay. On finding three on page four, the hearings officer discusses the need for a new goal three exception. The reasons exception taken for the property when the Brooks Hotmer plan was adopted was specific to warehousing that was taking place in the property at that time. <clears throat> in order to remove that limited use overlay and allow other uses, a new exception is required. In this instance, the applicant is seeking a physically developed exception, meaning the property is developed to such an extent there is no longer available for farm use. The hearings officer conducted the public hearing on March 10th, 2020, and after detailed analysis, the hearings officer concluded that the applicant met the burden of proving that all the criteria for a zone change and exception to goal three and a comp plan amendment were met and recommended approval subject to three conditions. The conditions include applying for review of on-site sewage treatment capacity. If using water and manufacturing process, the applicant shall review sewer capacity and submit evidence that the Brooks Community Sewer Plan sewer system will serve the use. And finally, the applicant shall implement erosion control measures in conjunction with any fill needed for the proposed ramp. The board has the options of continuing the public hearing, close the hearing and leave the record open, and close the hearing, approve, modify, or deny the request, or remand the matter back to the hearings officer. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Any questions for Joe? I don't know. Good. Okay, Mr. Shipman, now it's your turn. Thank you, Commissioner Willis. Uh, for the record, Mark Shipman again. Uh, we agree with the hearings officer's recommendation to you. Uh, as we satisfy all the mandatory approval criteria for this combined application request. 
We also rec uh, agree with the recommended conditions of approval that she identified in her uh, report to you. As Joe identified, this approval will enable Schmeckety Community College to establish their diesel mechanic associate's degree program, which is really needed for our community and our region. In closing, I'd respectfully request that you pr approve our consolidated application request with the three conditions of approval as noted. I'm happy to address any questions that you may have of me at this time. Thank you for your consideration. Any questions, Mr. Shipman? No, but I didn't study this one real hard. It was fairly routine, but what are those three conditions just because I didn't see? I'm sorry you brought it up now. Uh, the first is to, prior to establishing uh, the industrial use and to um, applying for building permits, we need to apply for a review of on-site uh, sewage treatment, uh, which is standard. And then second, uh, prior to establishing the use, uh, we need to identify that water uh, in any manufacturing process. Um, uh, we need to uh, provide review of sewer capacity to submit evidence that the community sewer, sewer systems at Brooks uh, can, can also serve the use. Um, and that kind of ties in with uh, the first condition approval as well. And then the third is that we need to uh, uh, essentially implement an erosion control measure in conjunction with any film uh, work needed for a ramp. And the, the college is proposing to put a, uh, an essentially a ramp off of the west side of the building that will tie in with their existing property to the west. Uh, so students will be traveling from the current Brooks campus um, to the east to this facility, those in the diesel mechanic uh, training program, and then likewise they'll be uh, parking and returning uh, uh, to the west. So it's three very standard conditions yeah. of approval um, and all that are very, uh, very achievable in this case. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner, I, I read the hearings officer decision. It's, it seems very straightforward. There's already a facility there. Yes, this is the Red Steer Glove Manufacturing Building, and we, we've negotiated a, a, a lease with the owners of the building to take a portion of that building. Um, we're, there's going to be putting in, like I said, a, a ramp because the building's elevated. Uh, there's going to be roll-up doors that are installed, um, and it's going to be large enough to be able to have, um, have the diesel mechanic uh, uh, program there. And there's only 25 kids that are going to, or, or students, they're anticipating at a time. And 25 students at a time, that's correct. So the number of people there isn't going to be much bigger, and the traffic use isn't going to be any different than it currently is, and the no. water use. Or, yeah, it seemed like it seemed like this is more of like an administrative change rather than actual a change in sort of the impact of the community. But in order to get there, the, yes. the zoning, um, we needed to change a lot with the zoning, and that's what this, these applications do, is that it enables us to be able to get in uh, with appropriate building permits and septic uh, approvals in order to get that, that uh, program in the building. That goes. Mr. Chair, this is for the diesel program. Yeah. We, we just want to make sure that we declare this right here, that we, we before you got here, we gave $100,000 to Mecca in a, in a uh, lottery grant to help with this program, and so we do have some prior knowledge to this program, and I just wanted to make that really clear. I don't, Commissioner, if you want to add anything to that before we take our vote. so. Um, council, is there anything? Okay, good. All right, I think I'd like to make a motion that we close the public hearing and approve the request as presented. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank Great, you. thanks so much. Thank thanks, you. Joe. Really appreciate it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Your turn to read the calendar. All right. Good to see you, Mark. Been a while. You must have been in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Today at 11 o'clock, uh, we have our uh, BOC policy, me and the commissioner's boardroom here on the fifth floor. Uh, also today at 2 o'clock, Marion County Extension 4-H fiscal year 2020-21 budget proposal commissioner's boardroom here on the fifth floor tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, 2021 budget session uh, I believe that's here in the senator hearing room but also on zoom um, and that's at 9 o'clock tomorrow on Thursday at 3 o'clock Mid Valley recovery team economic recovery team zoom meeting uh, Friday 9 a.m. special meeting North County uh, delegation in the commissioner's 
boardroom. That'll be a dial-in call on 529, also Friday at 10 a.m., special meeting with Salem-Kaiser. Uh, same as above, dial-in call, commissioner's boardroom, Friday at, um, I think this may be a misprint. I think this goes 11 to noon. Uh, East South County is uh, same thing, dial-in call, commissioner's boardroom. The Monday 6-1 at 8.30 a.m. calendar review, commissioner's boardroom here on the fifth floor. Monday at 9 o'clock, management update in the commissioner's boardroom here on the fifth floor. Tuesday the 2nd at 3 o'clock, Mid-Valley Recovery Team Zoom meeting. Uh, and then Wednesday at 9 a.m. back here for our board weekly board session. Wednesday at 11 a.m. the third BOC policy meeting commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor. Wednesday at noon, Woodburn Marion County meeting. I don't know that we're going to do that or not. Um, it shows Casa Marquez, 55 North Front Street, Woodburn. I'd, I'd sure like to talk to him, but I don't think it's time yet. Not in that little room in Woodburn. Yeah, the bigger room we used to live in, we could all be six or we used to work live in. We used to eat in, could all be six feet apart, but we are communicating with them via these Zoom meetings that we um, had on North County, too. So um, that's our calendar for next week, this week and next week. That is. Not a little one. We're back in the swing of things. Yeah, it hasn't been for a while. This morning I was watching the news and they were lining up the that private rocket ship. Brought back yeah. memories as a youngster. I'd, I'd get up and watch every one, little, little Admiral TV and watch it go. But one story I probably never told you that I it, it was thinking of this morning in, what year would it be, 1973. I took a, they had an exchange. I took a semester and went to South Florida. And we went over. Oh, wow. Hey, hey, I got great <laughs> grades. All I did was study. That's a fact. But we took a trip. There were some kids from Oregon, and we went over to Cape Canaveral Kennedy and watched uh, uh, Skylab go up, and it was the last Saturn V. Um, they let you get probably like 10 miles away. It looks like, what, maybe an inch and a half or so on the horizon. Mm -hmm. But when that rascal went up, you I'm not kidding you. Oh, my. There was a roar and a flash. It was a real deal, and cool. it's it stuck a long time. So that was all coming back to me this morning. You know that particular Skylab fell down. I don't know what year that was, but like 15, 20 years later, I always thought it would have been fun to watch it go up and go down. But <laughs> I didn't want to be under it. I think it landed out in the, like the Indian Ocean or something. But what that, time is is the rocket going up today? I, I don't know that for sure. I think probably it seems like right about now. So I hope they don't have any trouble anyway. It's funny how you know, now it's a big deal to go up in a private uh, where it was a huge national effort, of course. Mm -hmm. and interesting. You know, I saw that too briefly. I had the TV on this morning while I was getting ready. Uh, and I, it's interesting how it brings back memories of flash, you know, kind of flashbacks. Uh, I remember the first space shuttle. We were in somebody's... I was a trainer and I was getting ready to go north up into Washington to do this training and we were at somebody's house picking them up and the space shuttle went off. And then the other one I remember, okay, I can remember where I was when we walked on the moon. Oh yeah. Right? Good. I, 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 were you born yet? No. <laughs> really? Uh, well, maybe it didn't even happen. Uh, Is that what you think? So, so I remember where I was with my parents in, in the room, I, I'll never forget that. And then. I remember where I was when the first space shuttle went off. And then the other one that I'll never forget, I was in a Kmart electronics store. Challenger. When it blew up oh, in, in Denver, Colorado. That's terrible. So whatever year that was, it must have been 85 or 6 when that happened. Um, yeah, there's just certain things that you remember about for me. On that and, one. I was fishing with my grandfather in Tillamook, and I called home, and Tammy said, have you heard the news? We were in a restaurant, and I said, no, what? And just as she's saying that, I see a TV screen, and they're showing that. What? That's yeah, true. that sticks with you. 
and then and then you know recently what's what is this the 40 year anniversary of Mount St. Helens yeah is that right so I was uh, running a restaurant in Marysville California so I didn't I had moved I had graduated from OSU and moved down to Marysville and uh, I remember hearing about that but didn't experience it until because that happened in well it was May and then I moved back here in November and saw the I remember going driving up the freeway going to Seattle I was in the restaurant business to visit these restaurants and I went across that bridge on I-5 just oh, it north of north of like Richfield Kalama and it was just full of ash and trees and all that mm -hmm. stuff and there's still an ash pile oh yeah that they moved to dredge that thing when you bring that up uh, we we had been up fishing at Detroit and then heard about it on the way home and I do remember you from sublimity state and you could see you know the actual eruption but but my mind goes back it's in the week or so afterwards and we're doing a fire drill out east of sublimity drafting water out of mill creek and it was just like like kind of out of the Bible or something, this ash started rolling towards us and it was like the angel of death thing is what, I'm not mm. kidding. And I was assistant chief and I said, we, I think we kind of want to wrap this up <laughs> and just get this part because it, it, a dose really came over. I didn't, they were all afraid of damage to vehicles and stuff. I don't remember hearing that or seeing that it happened, but yeah, wow. that was a wild time too. Unfortunately, I remember too many things because that's too many years. I just got a text from Chad. It's 1.33 today, so oh, it hasn't it? gone up yet, the oh, rocket, good. so we can watch it. I'd almost rather just have it say it went all right. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Very good. All right. Well, with that, we'll adjourn.